I just want to thank everyone who is with us. This is the webinar from YNPN, Not Young Nonprofit Professionals Network, about developing human capital for chapter success. So a few uh, pieces about our agenda and our format and some housekeeping items as we get the webinar started. Um, our agenda for the webinar, we're going to start by uh, doing introductions, finding out who from our various YNPN chapters is with us today as well as who our presenters, guest speakers, and hosts are. Following the introductions, we are very excited to have a, presen a presentation from a guest presenter, um, Aaron Hartman. And we will also have time uh, for all of you to pose questions to Aaron as the webinar is happening. And we will finish out today's webinar with some updates from YNPN National um, for all of you to take back to your chapters. But a few pieces of housekeeping, um, some of you might be new to this webinar software as we're also uh, learning on how to make it work. The first is the chat feature. Um, you can use the chat feature throughout the webinar uh, to share your questions or comments and generally just interact with this marked YNPN National. That is Ashley, one of our co-hosts, who will be following along the questions and comments and keeping us posted with what comes up. So the chat question is your first tip. Use that for questions or comments throughout the webinar. The second is what you'll be hearing during the webinar. Ashley is uh, primarily going to be muting all of the people that aren't speaking. So for the most part, all of us will be muted on this webinar, with the exception of our guest presenter, myself. And participants will be unmuted um, when asking questions to the guest presenter. So Ashley will talk you through that. Um, some other things to keep in mind, this webinar is going to be around one hour long and it will be recorded. So if there's anything that comes up that you want to refer back to or if you want to fill in folks from your chapter or other folks who couldn't make this webinar, it will be recorded and available for later use. So first I'm going to turn it over to Ashley, uh, my co-host, and you'll hear more about us in a moment. But Ashley is going to help uh, identify who is joining us on the webinar tonight. Ashley? All right, guys, so if you want to go ahead and uh, type what your chapter name is into the chat, um, I'll go ahead and announce them after we do introductions of our speakers tonight. So I'll just say this is Betty Jean again, and we are really grateful. Um, Ashley and I, in the planning of our webinars and in our work with YNPN, have benefited a lot from Erin Barnhart's wisdom. And immediately when we plan these webinars, we asked her to be a guest presenter and share more of what she knows with all of you. So Erin, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and the work that you do? I can. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Fabulous. Okay. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for having me uh, join you this, this evening. Um, my work is, is probably best summarized as saying I am a very big nerd slash fan for anything volunteer engagement. Um, I've, I've based my career around identifying strategies for more effective, meaningful service, uh, whether that's in a domestic national service capacity or uh, all volunteer organizations, boards and committees. Um, I've done a, a significant amount of work around international development, uh, volunteering and international service. Um, as far as how that works out professionally, I spent many years as the, uh, well, many being four, as the uh, director of volunteerism initiatives with idealist.org. I've done a fair amount of consulting, working with organizations uh, around the U.S. as well as internationally. Um, I finished my Ph.D. studying international service this last year and actually do some, some university teaching. And these days, one of my primary roles is serving as the graduate program director for a Master of Arts in International Development and Service program uh, facilitated by IPSL and Concordia University in Portland, Oregon. So um, it's a pleasure for me to join you. I've long been a YNPN fan and um, am thrilled to be able to provide any insights to help, uh, help facilitate or rather to help add to the work that you're already doing. So thank you for having me. Wonderful. Um, so that is Erin Barnhart, our guest presenter. I also want to turn it over to Ashley and have Ashley introduce herself a little bit about her and her work. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Hartman. Uh, I am the Launchpad Fellow along with Betty Jean. Uh, I am the Field Coordinator, so my work with YMPN has been all about trying to uh, develop 
resources and support systems to ensure that our chapters are able to be as mo- most successful as possible. I got, but yeah, it's just been a pleasure to get to to know more of the folks working in our chapters. Um, and I also wanted to announce who is on the call. We have folks from Jake, Pittsburgh, uh, Greater Seattle, Savannah, Chicago, Austin, Atlanta, San Diego. So Grand Rapids, San Diego, um, Greater Buffalo, which is one of our newest chapters, um, Atlanta, Chicago, Savannah, Greater Seattle, Pittsburgh. I think I've got everyone now. Great. (laughs) Wonderful. Um, So first of all, I just want to say thanks to everyone out there hearing us and for sticking with us through technical difficulties. We're very excited about the webinar, no matter what hiccups might come up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the other thing I want to say about Ashley is I'm very grateful because Ashley is um, running logistics and uh, technical aspects for tonight's webinar. So she's going to make things like interactive polls and chats and Q&A happen. Um, and just as a reminder, as I said early on the call, um, in the actual chat room, uh, Ashley is listed as VanPN National. So if you want to submit a comment or a question, submit it into the chat box. And as we're running this webinar, Ashley is going to be following along with those comments and questions. And when we get to our Q&A later, um, Ashley will prompt people to pose their questions to Erin. So I think we're going to um, start diving right into the content of this call. Um, first, let me just briefly introduce uh, who I am and how I'm involved. My name is Betty Jean. And like Ashley, I am one of the Launchpad National Fellows for YNPN. Um, Ashley's work is as field coordinator, uh, providing direct service in a variety of ways, support and service to our chapters. My role is as the national talent coordinator, so I am supporting YNPN leaders ranging from our director, our national board, our fellows, and our chapters around all kinds of issues ranging from recruiting and retaining leaders to managing volunteers, uh, growing chapters and organizations, Uh, adding staff and transitioning staffing models, and building organizational culture. So amid both the work that Ashley has been doing supporting chapters and the work that I've been doing on uh, managing and developing talent at YMPN, we've uh, really seen a mutual opportunity to support chapters um, around human capital or talent and addressing some common challenges that are coming up. So Ashley, if you want to go to the uh, the next slide, There are some lessons that we've actually gotten from chapters already. Um, You probably all know because you may have been in touch with Ashley or in touch with our national director, Trish, but there are a variety of ways that we reach out from chapters and find out what is going on for them, what they're um, challenged by, what kind of resources they want from YNPN. Um, A few of the lessons that I want to share, we learned on the 2013 virtual road trip where we interacted with that were common for a variety of chapters around these issues of talent management is this idea of fluxes or and values. Almost all chapters, especially if they were newer or emerging chapters, spoke about going through a similar kind of life cycle. Um, it looked along the lines of, of this, that in the beginning there was a lot of for uh, the period following their leadership, the chapter would all chapters most seem to be using a similar kind of pipeline or trajectory. That first someone becomes a member of a chapter, they next become a committee volunteer, eventually they will become a board member and work within that structure to build capacity and um, create a pipeline for other leadership. The last theme that I want to mention right now um, were challenges around burnout and sustainability. Um, Often we found that Chapters were, well, they, they would get to a point where they had built up enough volunteer capacity to offer lots and lots of programming. They're very excited about this programming. And then eventually there's the moment where they realize that it's unsustainable, it's an unmanageable amount, it's beyond the capacity they have, and they're burning out volunteers. A number of chapters talked about the process of them having to dial back programming um, and aiming for quality and consistency of programming rather than sheer volume to make that more manageable and sustainable. So those are some of the themes that we heard from chapters on our virtual road trip. And in general, it seemed like one of the biggest ways that chapters were um, asking for help was looking at these topics of talent. Um, I also want to mention that there's some lessons that we've gotten from looking at talent management on a national scale for YNPN. 
um, that first bullet I mentioned is around the fact that YMPN has done several rounds of assessments. Uh, we'll talk with Aaron tonight about how to do assessments around human capital and talent needs. Um, one assessment that YNPN did was before deciding to hire a national director. There was a multifaceted assessment to even explore whether that was the best option or whether there were other options of staffing and growing the YNPN national structure that would meet its goals. So assessments is one theme about talent management on the national level for YNPN. Another theme is that um, YNPN National has had a very significant shift around talent. Um, nationally, we've gone from being an all-volunteer-led organization to hiring paid staff, a paid director, as well as establishing the Launchpad Fellows Program, fellows being a hybrid volunteer staff model. Um, and then that last point I wanted to make again is just that we've gotten consistent requests from Chapter for support around these issues of talent. So that is what tonight's webinar is about. Um, I'd say let's get right into it. Um, we have Aaron here to answer some questions that are coming up from chapters. And the first question that I want to put out and let Aaron respond to is, Aaron, how do you suggest that chapters conduct an assessment um, for themselves, sort of to figure out how can they match their organizational goals with the talent or personnel needed to make those goals happen? What does that assessment process look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, there are a couple of different strategies that chapters can, uh, can employ to try to get a, a realistic sense of what the talent is like in their, in their, in their membership, in their population. Um, the first and foremost step that I'd recommend is facilitating an appraisal of personal skills, goals, and interests. Um, and sometimes this requires a little a little guidance with the process. So certainly asking people within your network, within your membership, what are your skills and talents? These might be things you do in your professional life. Uh, they may be things you do more as a hobby, as part of your, your personal, personal life or recreation. They may be things that you have some experience with but have been wanting to expand upon. Um, in general, getting your, your, the folks within your network to really start thinking about and assessing what their skills and talents are is, is a great process for two main reasons. Um, the first reason is you can start to catalog and map what the skills and talents are within your, within your membership. Uh, especially for an all-volunteer group, that human capital can easily be your most valuable asset. Um, so getting a sense for who has experience with website design, um, who is a trained facilitator, uh, who is someone who is is talented with taking a very big issue and breaking it down into the next steps that need to happen in order to take something on. These are all concrete skill sets. So helping to facilitate that among your membership. And that can be done by sending out a, a core number of questions. It can be done by doing a survey monkey or some other web-based survey tool. Um, but collecting that information will give you a better sense of where your talents are and where some gaps might be. So you can potentially find additional folks to help you fill those gaps. At the same time, getting a better sense of individually having your membership decide for themselves or determine for themselves what their skills and interests and goals are is going to help them start thinking about what it is that they enjoy doing, what it is that they would like to do. And that is actually one of the cornerstones of successful volunteer engagement is we have plenty of research to back this up, that the more the individual volunteer their interests and what they'd like to do, um, the more successful you will be in finding a great fit for them, and the more likely they are to keep coming back and retain and sustain that relationship. So starting that assessment process with explicitly asking, what are your skills, your talents, what would you like to try, what would you like to learn, to help them begin that process, but also to gather the information yourself. Uh, the second piece of that is encouraging an honest assessment of capacity. Um, and when you were talking about the peaks and the valleys, oftentimes when you have a founder relationship with uh, volunteer work, the inclination is to give a lot of time and a lot of energy because you're so impassioned and it's your, it's your baby in many ways. You're, you're so ready to give. And unfortunately, that is often what leads to, A, a bit of burnout because you give so much so intensively it's difficult to sustain. And secondly, it's difficult to sustain to the next second generation of leadership because that initial launch uh, aspect is missing. 
So asking people to do an honest assessment of capacity, considering what does their availability really look like? Um, how much time in a perfect world would they like to commit to? Um, do they feel like they could serve effectively on a committee that's meeting uh, once a week? Do they feel like they would be more effective as an ad hoc volunteer? Understand that being realistic about your capacity is is better, and, and one of the things we'll talk about later in this call is creating that culture of sustainability and, and recognizing a collective action as opposed to individual action. But helping them let, let them know that saying no to something right now doesn't mean saying never, um, it's being realistic. So that's part of that talent assessment is also that availability assessment. Um, just a pause real quick, I know I'm talking for a bit. Can you hear me okay as I go? Yes. Can you hear okay, excellent. <laughs> Um, so the next one is um, encouraging uh, actors in the overall vision goal and task role management. What that means is as a chapter, as you're developing a project or a new, a new initiative, um, as you begin that visioning process, invite the people who are participating to participate in that. Um, ask them what does success look like for them. Ask them uh, questions to help envision what a successful outcome would look like. And then start to move backwards from that into uh, creating tasks and roles that ultimately the volunteers, the members, the network themselves have, have helped to design. That again reinforces that idea of ownership, of saying I played a role in determining the tasks that need to happen in order for us to be successful. I have an awareness of what I'm good at, what my availability is, therefore I am equipped to be able to decide if I can take that on. Um, also breaking those bigger goals into smaller pieces that can be shared and or interchangeable is critical to not overworking folks, not having them burn out because there's simply too much to do. Um, if you ask someone to say, hey, can you manage the publicity for this event? That's a really big ask. Um, and a lot of people will say, no, 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 no. And one person may say yes, and then they may discover, I, don't really, I didn't really think through what it means to manage the publicity. If instead you can break it down into who here can commit to contacting you know, the three major newspapers in our area. Who here can, can, can commit to posting on Craigslist or other event listservs? Um, when you can break it down into more concrete steps, it's, it's, much more, uh, it's, it's much more manageable, it's much more accessible. And we'll talk a little more about that as well. And then finally, the last uh, step on this, I would say, is as you're doing this assessment, making it always very clear that you're welcoming all types and levels of involvement. Um, people move in and out of roles throughout their, their life cycle with an organization, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But all contributions are welcome. Um, often people will say no because they're afraid of taking on too much, or they'll say yes because they feel like they should, but it isn't something they can sustain. So if you start to create from the start a culture of, collective action, we collectively are going to complete these tasks and move our network forward. So we want people to be honest about what they're, what they're capable of, what they can contribute, and welcoming that all types of involvement are, are critical to the overall success. Um, that starts to create that realistic assessment of who is our talent and how can we employ them. Excellent. Thanks, Erin. Um, before we go to the next question, I just want to quickly pause and say that Ashley is going to be trying to use an interactive feature on this webinar, which is called a poll. So you may see a poll pop up in just a moment or at another point uh, during the webinar, and that's just a way for uh, you all to interact with each other and for us to get more information about who's on the call and who has what kind of questions or topics on their mind or coming up for them. Um, so there's a poll coming up. Um, and as people are filling out that poll, um, I'm going to ask Erin the next question, which is, Erin, um, for YNPN chapters, what's the range of staffing models or talent models that are options for us? For example, you know, we have primarily chapters that are no paid staff, only volunteers. We have some people experimenting with staff or volunteer hybrids. Can you talk about what different talent or staffing models look like? Sure. Um, there are sort of three broader models, and then there are hybrid models all, all around, certainly. You can pick and choose from what works well for you. Um, the first of those is the all-volunteer model, and this means there is no paid staff person. Um, it is literally what it is. It's all-volunteer. Everyone contributing, everyone leading, everyone making governance decisions um, are all doing so in a voluntary capacity. And this can be a very successful model, um, but certainly there are the pros and cons to each one of these models, which I know we'll talk about in a moment. Um, a secondary model can be having at least some paid staff. Um, this may be hiring someone who is serving as, uh, you know, an executive director, or they might be serving as someone who is uh, in perhaps more of an administrative assistant role. There's, there are a number of different ways this can be structured. 
Um, and ultimately, often what that comes down to is whether it, whether you can afford it. Um, if you have the financial resources available to hire someone uh, to be a staff person, one or more people, that's often a, a great boon to your uh, capacity to contribute more. Um, when you're talking about a largely volunteer group and only one or perhaps two staff people, oftentimes the role of that staff person is the facilitator, keeping all those plates spinning, uh, checking in with the various committees and groups to make sure things are moving forward, or that of the capacity builder. Um, they may be working on fundraising or seeking donations or uh, some of the volunteer and largely vo a volunteer group with a work of the volunteer uh, entity to keep moving. And the volunteer roles, the boards, the committee members, those are the ones who are really doing most of the hands-on work. Um, the third model is having a type of staff person, but having it be a little more ad hoc. So it isn't an employee so much as it might be someone who has received a stipend or someone who's hired on a contract basis. And this might be um, bringing in uh, paid interns, have offering fellowships. Um, this may be, if it's something that's available to you, partnering with service corps, like AmeriCorps, for example, is a stipended, uh, stipended role. Um, it can also be hiring uh, facilitators or contractors on a case-by-case -case basis. So for example, Strategic planning is one area where I generally uh, recommend that if you can't afford it, it is a great asset to be able to bring in a skilled facilitator to lead that process. Um, not only because they can help to identify the top level issues and are trained in that, but also because they ultimately aren't invested in the outcome. And we are talking about very big planning models like strategic planning for an overall entity, having that impartiality can be invaluable. Um, so the, all of these models are, are interchangeable. You may be all volunteer, except sometimes you hire a contract staff person. You may have paid staff, and you also occasionally bring on stipends. Um, you may have paid staff, and at some point it becomes something that you cannot sustain, and so you move back to an all volunteer. Um, and each one of these models have pros and cons. And I, I know that on our next slide here, we're going to talk a little bit about what some of these differences might be. And we're also going to display the results of that poll that we just did. So we can see for the question, how much of a challenge is it for chapters to recruit and develop the leaders you need to make your vision and goals a reality? 38% um, people said it was a significant challenge. 63% said it was somewhat of a challenge. Nobody said it wasn't a challenge. So um, we're curious to hear more from people. If you have a question, um, feel free to type them in as we're talking, as we're hearing from Aaron. Um, Ashley's going to go through those questions and we'll have a, a chance to do Q&A a little bit later. So any questions coming up or comments, feel free to just uh, put those right in the chat window. Our next question for Aaron. Um, so Aaron, some of our chapters, not all, but some, are considering shifting from an exclusively volunteer-run organization to one with paid staffing for the first time. And certainly uh, YMCA National has gone through that transition recently and is still learning from it. Can you talk about what that shift from exclusively volunteer to paid staff looks like? What are some of the common challenges and ways to overcome them? Sure, absolutely. Um, so there are, there are absolutely pros and cons to these models. Um, and, and when you're talking about bringing on a staff person in particular, the pros are, are many of the things you would imagine. For example, having someone who can keep tabs on everything that's happening at once. Um, when you have a group of smart, talented, ambitious people, basically any YNPN chapter, you have a lot of moving parts. And there's a lot of ambitious projects going on and many things that people are, are, are moving forward. And having a paid staff person means that there is someone whose time is dedicated in a formal way to making sure that all those pieces are still moving. Um, there's someone who's overseeing from a 30,000 foot view what's happening. Now, certainly that isn't to say that that can't happen with an all-volunteer organization. And in fact, many of your chapters are still all-volunteer and will continue to be. So that can still happen. But having that paid staff person, a significant pro can be that there is there's a, somewhere where um, the buck stops in terms of who's paying attention, who's making sure everything is moving forward, um, who's asking the questions or can follow up on, on some of those loose threads that have a have a habit of making their way through when there are so many actors moving at the same time. Now, there are also some, some challenges to this, of course. Um, first and foremost, it is there is an expense. Um, when you have a paid staff person, of course, you have to have the financial resources to sustain that. 
Um, when you are, depending on your local economy, this can be a fairly, you know, you want to provide a living wage, of course, and you want it to be a wage that is on par with the skill set that you're seeking so that you are able to attract that candidate. Um, but it can be a fairly significant expense by the time you factor in such things as payroll and taxes and some of the other elements that go with that. Um, beyond the expenses, um, and again, also those are expenses that need to be sustainable um, because you need to make sure that you are hiring them for the foreseeable future rather than just a contract basis. Um, there's also the aspect of who manages them. Um, with a staff person where there's only one staff person and the rest is volunteer, there needs to be some sort of infrastructure around who is the supervisor, who, does, who oversees that employee's work, who is responsible for assessing the success of that work. Um, you know, oftentimes in using the NGO model, it is the, the formal board is who the executive director reports to, um, but needing to spend some time reading up on the labor, getting a better sense for what is this role, who are they ultimately responsible to, re to responding to, given our legal structure. Um, so there's, there's a bit of time involved to do that research around, making sure you are adhering to local, local national labor laws. Um, and then finally, there's the time aspect of finding the right candidates, uh, training, bringing them on, and then ultimately, you know, longer term supervising and managing their work. So the pro side, it can, it can significantly leverage the amount of work you're able to contribute, you're able to complete, because you have that person who's able to develop some of that capacity and facilitate some of the bigger picture issues. Um, but it also does take an investment of real money and time to find that right person and help them succeed in their role. Um, as far as managing that transition, my, my number one advice for anything like this is to seek those peer models that you can emulate. Um, talk to similarly structured membership organizations. Talk to some of your peers in the field. Talk to some of those uh, uh, national membership, uh, professional association organizations that are similarly structured and seek answers from them. Um, I have yet to meet an organization who is not willing to share how they went through this type of transition or these types of questions. You're not asking to see their budget. You're asking what their process was. Um, so seeking those peer models to learn from your peers what went well, what did not go well. Um, also seeking some uh, legal advice, whether that's pro bono or if you have the resources to hire uh, legal advice. Again, to confirm adherence with labor law and confirm uh, what are your responsibilities as an employer. Um, that's a really important piece, not only to treat your employee well, but also to protect yourself as an entity. Um, and then considering what are your options. Can you potentially hire them on a contract basis? Are you seeking to hire as a formal employee? Some of those pieces that are bigger picture issues that you're going to want to be clear on before you actually begin the hiring process. Um, as far as challenges and solutions, a couple of typical challenges are uh, hiring someone with the expectation they are, that they are going to solve many of the big picture issues that you may be having. Um, in other words, perhaps expecting them to do too much. And this is particularly common when you've hired someone part-time and then discover how quickly 20 hours of work a week goes by. Um, so part of the solution for that is having a very clear idea of the role of the staff person and what the expectations are of the staff person. And, and developing some ownership and having it be a participatory process among the leadership of the organization. Um, similarly, Another common challenge is a lack of oversight, that you hired the person and in your head you're thinking, hooray, we've got someone to keep an eye on everything, which gives, relieves you of that responsibility, but again, someone's responsible for overseeing them. Um, so determining in advance some type of clear infrastructure of management, who ultimately will be working with the staff person, who do they respond to, um, what are our measurements of success, what is our, what is our uh, human resource strategy around uh, partnering with this staff person, making sure that that oversight continues, that you now have a new partner in doing the work, but it isn't a matter of no longer being involved in it. And then finally, one of the common ones really is, is comes down to the sustainability. Um, if you have a really strong model, you have a, uh, if you're confident in the, in the, uh, the health rather of your financial sustainability, for example. Um, you feeling like, yes, this is something that we can afford over the longer term and we have, we have confidence and we have good reason to believe this is something that is a good investment for us, um, then absolutely this is something that can potentially move, be moved forward with. Um, the, the temptation sometimes can be, well, we have a surplus that so we should hire someone now because we can, um, but again, if it's not on a contract basis, that sustainability piece really is critical. Um, so being very honest about the financial aspect of taking on a paid staff person is another one of the common challenges. Um, and the solution to that, again, is to 
uh, talk to some peer models, talk to someone in, in human resources, talk to someone in labor law, try to get a real sense of what does it cost for us to hire a paid staff person, and is it something that we are confident we can sustain? Excellent. Um, so I just want to remind people, if any questions are coming up as you're hearing Erin's presentation, please type them into the chat box. We have a few more questions right now, and then we'll open it up to everyone else. Erin, um, talk to me about this phrase, developing a talent pipeline. What do we mean by that, particularly for you know predominantly volunteer organizations? How can chapters build a talent pipeline effectively? Yeah, I, I love this question. This is where I'm going to do my best not to talk too fast. I, I already talk fast, and I think I'm speaking slow, um, but I get very excited about this idea. Um, because the idea of creating a talent pipeline is in many ways rethinking how we engage people in voluntary action. Um, first and foremost, it's thinking about it in terms of a life cycle of engagement. Um, increasingly, what we're seeing is that NGOs and organizations that rely on donors and volunteers are starting to rethink how they engage them. And it's less about silos of this person is a donor, and this person is a volunteer, and this person will read and respond to us on social media. And increasingly thinking about it in terms of one individual over the course of their life may go through a period where they're a very active volunteer, and then they may stay, step back for some reason. It may be that they have a family, or their job has changed, or uh, some circumstance of their life has made it that they aren't as able to be as hands-on. Um, they may go through a period in their life where they're sort of a lurker. They're paying attention, but they're not really active. Um, they may go through a period in their life where they're able to be a donor. They have the financial resources to be a significant donor. Uh, the bottom line is most individuals don't only stay in one of those categories. Most people are moving throughout types of engagement when they are connected with and have a strong relationship with an entity, with an organization. So thinking about a cycle of engagement means not recruiting just for the volunteer role we have right now, but rather recruiting the individual to be our lifelong partner, um, and acknowledging that people will move in and out of states of availability throughout the course of their professional and personal lives. So our responsibility is to remain, uh, to work to keep them connected, and to open those doors and find opportunities for them to participate where and how they can. And one aspect of that is the concept of stepping forward and stepping back, encouraging a culture of self-awareness of capacity. I'm encouraging people to understand that we recognize and value their time, and we also recognize and value the fact that even our most valued volunteers at times have to say, I just can't. Um, I'm too busy. I have too much going on. And oftentimes, there is a guilt around that. There is a feeling of, I'm supposed to be doing this. I really care about the organization. I better just try to do it. And either we set them up to fail, or they have to drop the ball at some point, oftentimes later than they might have had there been, that honest space of saying, it is OK to say no. It is OK to say I can't. Um, so showing respect to step back. So rethinking also in terms of the volunteer role and thinking about it as a collective capacity. As one person steps back, someone else may be able to step forward. So it is about that idea of individual engagement and collective action. Each person gives and contributes how and when they can, and collectively we do the work. So thinking about it in terms of an overall fluid movement. Um, and a lot of this is reframing how people think about volunteering. So it's being oftentimes very explicit with your volunteers, with your members, of saying, we know real life gets in the way, and we know you care about what we do, and we want to keep you engaged. So let's create a culture here where it is fine to say no. And it is encouraged to say, I can take this piece, but not all of this. And encouraging one another to step forward and step back as you can so that people don't feel so overwhelmed and so uh, perhaps guilty that they can't do more. As people move through this model, this life cycle of engagement, when they are in that space where they are saying, I can't, I need to step back, what we ultimately don't want to do is lose them. And we don't want them to step back entirely to the point where they are no longer um, a participant in our effort. So one of the things we can do is establish what we call advisory roles. Um, this is like the emeritus role for, for our members. And it's keeping them on your radar and saying, we totally understand there's a lot of stuff going on. You may have a new family. You have a new job. All of the pieces of life that get in the way of volunteering. And saying, 
let's keep you connected because you have so much expertise and knowledge. We want to be able to, to make sure we can stay connected to you. And say, can instead of asking you to take on tasks or key roles, can we occasionally come to you with questions? Or as we develop a new project, would you be willing to look it over and give your advice? If you can move people into advisory roles that are much less hands-on and have a much lower threshold of commitment, we can often keep those people connected to you. And again, as their life circumstances change, they may be able to step up again. And if not, you've kept them connected as a supporter and as an advisor. And that's an important piece, again, of understanding that idea of that life cycle of engagement. Um, and then this, this next slide here, we'll talk a little bit about talent retention. And when we do that, that's also talking about some of these collective models of sharing the work that people understand they're able to, they understand this idea of the life cycle of engagement. They understand that it's OK for them to step back but they also understand that the work itself won't be quite as scary as it might otherwise be considered. Great. So yeah, that leads us right into the next question. Can you talk a little bit about effective ways to retain volunteers for the long term and avoid turnover? Yeah, this is a big one. And I, I know especially with an all-volunteer group and especially when you've got really skilled, talented people who also happen to be really busy. Um, <laughs> You don't want to do is get them engaged and then they have to drop out because either they've burned out or because there's other stuff coming up in the way and this idea of retention is really big um, and it is for all organizations but especially one that that relies so heavily on the human capital like like YMPN um, first and foremost one of the things you can do is try to create a culture of self-care and sustainability and again that's encouraging people to really be honest with their uh, with themselves about their own capacity um, and t creating a culture that says not only is it something you shouldn't feel guilty about, it's something you should be very aware of. That we are professionals in busy fields and we do work that we are proud and oftentimes it can be very busy, stressful work. So this importance of individual self-care is critical not only for your own well-being, but for the well-being of our network, well-being of our organization. We want you to care for yourself, step back when you need to so that you can at the same time thinking about our roles and responsibilities in ways that make them more accessible. Um, first and foremost, being clear with our tasks and responsibilities. So when we have that big ask, like someone needs to lead the publicity effort, breaking that down into more clear tasks. What does that actually mean to lead the publicity effort? Can we break it down into smaller pieces? Uh, volunteers are much more likely to step up if there's a clear ask. If it is, I need someone to identify 10 sources locally or 10 organizations locally or get in touch with the five major universities so that we can connect with students. Um, that is a much clearer ask and that is something I'm much more likely to say yes I can do because I have a real understanding of how much time and effort it might take. Um, similarly, when you can break those bigger tasks, bigger overall projects and outcomes into bite-sized pieces, it makes it easier for people to commit to it. It makes it easier for them to complete it and when you've established that culture of being aware of your capacity, being honest about your capacity, it then makes it easier for someone to ask for more work if they're able. And what we want to try to do when we're thinking about this establishment this type of culture is move people away from the idea of, I feel guilty, I better volunteer for something, okay, I'll take that, and then realizing I can't, it's so big, I'm not going to do it well. And instead moving into a space that says, here are the very real tasks, and someone saying, I will contact all the universities, and then being able to say, I did that, I got that done, what else can I do? Um, volunteering for more. That's something we want to be able to do. Um, the slide is actually uh, frozen on the one before. If we want to move one forward, that would be yeah, great. I think Ashley is having some technical difficulties on her end. So we will be moving the slides okay. forward as soon as we're able, but you can just keep chatting. I'll just keep talking. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, the, the next thing I wanted to talk briefly about is the idea of, and I mentioned this before around this idea of a, of a collective action, individual actions making up a collective effort. Um, when possible, if you can consider paired or partnered or team-based models, that again is a great way to take all of the pressure, not all, but to take as much of the pressure off any one individual to complete a task. Um, and it also makes it easier for them to step forward and step back as needed. So for example, if you can take something like we need someone to lead the publicity effort and say we need two or three people to lead this effort so that they as a group can take responsibility for it, break it down into the individual tasks, determine for themselves who's doing what, and then if person A said, yes, I'll contact the universities, but they're finding something's come up at work, their child is sick, something's come up and they're not able to do it, they can turn to persons B or C and say, I'm so sorry, I can't do it, 
B or C can say, great, we'll step up and do it. And then as A's situation changes, they can step back in. Um, when you have these team-based models, so it's less about we need someone to take this on and someone sort of reluctantly says, okay, I'll take it, and then they're on their own. Um, when it's broken down into something much smaller and it's shared, not only does it make it more accessible, not only does it make it so that they can negotiate among themselves who gets it done, um, but it also creates a, a social responsibility around completing the work. Um, again, the old model is, okay, I said I'll do publicity, and every night I think I really should work on that, but I'm so tired and I've got everything else going on, and I wait and I wait and I wait, and then now it's a, a guilt motivating me. When instead if it's a social responsibility of, hey, I said I would talk to the universities, and I know that person B and person C are waiting for me to do that before they can move forward with theirs. This isn't as big. It's something I, can t I agreed to because I, it's realistic. Um, that social responsibility is more effective often than that guilt. Um, so when you can move into that model of, of sharing the work, it makes it easier for people to, like again, step in, step back as needed. Um, that social responsibility to work with one another to complete it. But also, um, it also can you start to be able to use uh, different tools where people can work together actively using things like uh, Dropbox or Google, Google Drive, for example. Um, it makes it easier for people to be able to do the work because they're, they're collaborating to do it. And then the final thing uh, around retention is the idea of linking task to mission. Um, Many people will be very excited about the work that you're doing, and then once you break it down into a task, it might not seem as sexy. Um, if it's, hey, we really need people to be doing some fundraising, and someone thinks, I know fundraising is important, but ugh, I just I don't I don't want to do this. I mean, what does the money aspect have to do with it? Do I do I really fully understand why I'm asked to do this? Um, anytime you're creating a task or a role, being very clear about why it matters to your overall mission, why it matters to the overall project how it's critical to be done in order to be able to move forward. That again creates that social responsibility that, yes, this is important. I'm being counted on. I agreed to take on this realistic piece of work. Um, and it's also it's tied to the overall mission that I understand how that is. Again, all of this is around the idea of establishing much clearer, more realistic expectations so that people don't get so overwhelmed and so that ultimately you can retain them and give them that opportunity to be able to step back in as they're able. That is excellent, Erin. Thank you so much for everything you've put out already. Before we move into Q&A, um, I want to point out that Erin has shared some of her favorite resources, which we're going to put up there on a slide. If there are any resources that um, you all webinar participants are using around talent management um, and that your chapter is finding useful, please type them into the chat box. Um, I'm not sure that slide is readable to everyone, so I'm just going to read off the four key resources that Aaron shared. And Aaron, if you want to say anything about them, feel free to chime in. So the first resource sure. is called Energize Inc. And it's energizeinc.com. All right, those links are up now. The second is techsoup.org. We have coyotecommunications.com and boardsource.org. Aaron, anything you want to quickly say about any of these resources? Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, uh, all of these are have free resources. Um, many of them are entirely free. Uh, the first one, Energize Inc., is was developed by Susan Ellis, who is a guru in the field of volunteer engagement, and she and her team have collected of a vast uh, collection of links to online articles and tools around volunteer engagement, including a whole section on all volunteer groups. Um, so, highly recommend wandering through her resource library. Some terrific information there. TechSoup is primarily focused on technology for nonprofit organizations. Um, there are things in there on how to use tech tools, how to engage tech volunteers, how to use social media effectively. Again, really high quality uh, resources, entirely free. Coyote Communications is the website of a colleague of mine who does work, uh, many, much of it with international folks, but again, a lot of technology-based volunteer work, um, tools like volunteer software to consider. Um, again, well worth perusing through some of her essays to see if something might be useful. And then the final one is board source, and their work is specifically around board management and governance. Um, and, and not as much of their information is available free of charge, um, but some really valuable content there specifically around board governance, if that's something you're looking for. Excellent. So at this point, uh, this is Betty Jean. I'm going to turn it over to Ashley to kind of MC our Q&A with Erin. Ashley? All right. So the first question is, um, are these slides going to be shared? And I can answer that one. Yes, um, this webinar is being recorded, so the video will be available as well as the slides. 
Um, and it will all be available on the leader site. So I will talk more about that later. Um, next, from San Diego, uh, Lauren said that her chapter does a really good job at recruiting talented folks, but then has the, the larger challenge in developing, managing, and ret retaining those folks, um, specifically because a lot of our leaders are young and very mobile folks. Uh, so Erin, I don't know if you have anything to add on that comment. Yeah, that's and that's this is a tricky group to keep retained, um, to keep a hold of because for that exact reason, um, these are folks who are really mobile. Um, they may move very quickly because a new job opportunity has come up. Um, life circumstances are changing so rapidly. Um, so part of it is, I think, embracing that idea of the life cycle enga of engagement, of welcoming them in, saying we want your voice, your contribution, but we also acknowledge that what you can contribute may change on any given day. Um, so trying to create some of those those opportunities that are the smaller type roles, but also places where they can serve as an advisor. Um, also using some of the web-based tools, making it easier, and this is something I didn't talk much about, but making it easier for the folks in your committee and your, in your uh, rather in your network and your membership um, to be able to provide thoughts and feedback on things at, on their own time. Um, using free tools like Google Drive where you may put a question up and say everyone is welcome to please contribute ideas to this. Um, you can do things like strategic planning or designing projects using online tools and asking people to contribute on their own time. And then ultimately with the mobility of these volunteers, um, if it is that they have you know, moved out of your area, um, you know, that is something that is tricky, but again if you can keep that thread alive with them, if there's a possibility that they are going to come back, then obviously that's someone that you want to keep that connection with. Um, so using some of those network tools like social media, using your, your email connections so that you're able to um, keep that thread alive, whether they've moved away or just their job has pulled them away, at least momentarily, um, and try to entice them back. Again, coming back to that idea of the talent assessment, if there's some training um, and you don't have anything really interesting around that right now and you feel like they might be waning a little or their work has pulled them away, if three months from now an opportunity comes up and we need someone who can take a, take a, tr take a crack at that, that's something that you can easily go back to and say, oh, right, Sarah was really interested in that. I'm going to shoot her an email and say, hey, Sarah, how are things these days? Um, we're so glad you're still a part of our network. We know you've been really busy. This opportunity came up, and I knew it was something you're interested in. Would you be, uh, would you be up for taking on part of this work or helping us to helping advise us on how to do it? Um, so having that clear understanding of what they're interested in and keeping that thread alive even when they step back, even if it seems like they've stepped back permanently, um, that makes it much easier for you to try to re-engage them in the future. I hope that helps. Great. And I'm going to read off the questions in the chat. And if anyone has further questions, um, feel free to raise your hand, and then I'll be able to unmute you, and you can add some additional questions if they come up. Uh, next, uh, Ryan from Greater Buffalo asked the question, um, in the context of talent retention, what are your thoughts on the value of volunteer recognition, especially in relationship to YNPN? Um, and I'll add, too, if, uh, with any of these questions, if folks on the call would like to add something, again, raise your hand, and I'll be able to unmute you. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm a huge fan of volunteer recognition, um, and I should, <laughs> should preface that by saying, that uh, it's, there are so many different ways that volunteers can be recognized. And I will be the first to say I'm not as much of a fan of recognition when it's, it's stuff, um, when it's a trinket of some kind. Certainly there are ones that are really cool. Like I'm a big fan of buttons and pins because that's something you can wear with pride. Um, but I occasionally get the catalogs for things like mugs and, and other things that I think don't matter, aren't as valued by, by all volunteers as, as the recognition of their time is. Um, the, the sheer saying thank you, recognition of work, recognition of value is critical. Um, people don't volunteer, most people I should say, don't volunteer to be recognized, but it's incredible how quickly someone can start to, the experience can start to sour for them if they don't feel valued. Um, they can have entirely altruistic reasons, but if they're not being recognized for the work that they're doing, it will affect how they feel about the work. Um, so making sure that people are recognized in at least a private way, whether it's a handwritten note or an email saying, we couldn't have done this without you. Um, for many people, public recognition is valuable. It's important to ask because some people, that's very embarrassing to be publicly recognized. Um, but if they're comfortable with it, being able to share the successes with your, with your membership, with your network, especially with this group, one of the most valuable things you might be able to offer is a letter of recommendation or recognition or some type of 
formal uh, paper trail, essentially, that is able to say, this person contributed something invaluable to our professional network, and it has helped to move us forward. That is something that's really valuable to, to young professionals, as we all know, being young professionals. Um, so being able to perhaps offer some type of, of letter of recognition, letter of recommendation can be critical. Um, another model that I've heard of that works really well with young professionals is hosting professional development workshops as a thing.